Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and I'm just kind of taking it easy here on a weekend, and I thought I would get my video together for Monday morning. So we'll do this in kind of a relaxed way. Now, the subject today is going to be the test that I administered the channel members over on the asylum the other day, a general science knowledge test. Now, I've already presented their test results. I've also put up the link to the original quiz, which was five minutes long and then their entire uncut responses. So both of these are unlisted videos. I have put the information out on two videos from last week, but I wanted to have full disclosure in case anybody wanted to look into it a little deeper. So let's take a moment and go over their answers. Now, as I said when I went over to the asylum, the purpose of this test was not to make anybody look stupid or make fun of them. It was a general test of their knowledge of the Globe Earth model and Globe Earth science. But more importantly, I wanted to have a look at the thought process of the science denial community. So let's start off with the first question. Now, given a box of length, width, and depth, we could describe every point in that box using an X, Y, and Z coordinate. I then put a rock in the box, and I asked if we could describe every point on the surface with those same X, Y, and Z coordinates. Now, this is obviously a test to see their ability to think in three dimensions, and most of them did pretty well. We had one individual, I believe her name was Shines, who raised a bunch of very strange objections. She said that we could only define the parameters of the box or the perimeter of the box. She was basically making objections for no purpose other than to make objections because she was being contrarian and argumentative. And many of the viewers noted this when they saw the original videos and talked about her paranoia and how far she was in the rabbit hole. Now, of the five characteristics of science denial, this is an example of conspiratorial thinking and poor scientific reasoning. So let's go on to the next one. Now, the next question had to do with longitude and latitude and whether or not longitude and latitude described a single point on the surface of the Earth. Now, as you know, longitude and latitude is how we describe our location on Earth. Every point on Earth has got a single longitude and latitude. Now, the approach that they seem to take on that is, well, yeah, that's what the globe Earth model says. Now, when people deny the existence of longitude and latitude or claim that they're made up imaginary numbers, I challenge them to go ahead and screen shoot their own location and see whether or not I can send them a picture of their house in about one minute. So far, I've not had anybody take me up on that. Although they did look at it as kind of an artificial construct, and in a way it is because it's a coordinate system, one of the things that was very interesting was I did get a comment that said, well, Actually, there could be two points on Earth that have exactly the same longitude and latitude. For example, if you were at a shore and there was a cliff overhanging you or you were in the mouth of a cave, you could have a particular longitude and latitude, and the point on the top of the cliff could have the same longitude and latitude. Now, obviously, this is addressed by the third set of coordinates that we use when describing locations on the Earth, specifically elevations above and below the geoid. But it's a good example of characteristic number five, an inappropriate expectation of perfection from science. It seems as though they had to find some sort of an exception to show that somehow that was wrong. Well, it's not wrong. Now, the next question was actually rather difficult and it was a test of mathematics ability. Given that Sydney and Perth, Australia have got very precise coordinates for their location, how would you calculate, and specifically calculate, the distance between those two cities? Well, it became apparent almost immediately that they didn't have the first clue as to how to calculate the distance between two points, whether they be on a flat surface or on the surface of a sphere. So rather than even attempt to come up with either the Haversine equation or the law of cosines, they attempted to divert 
Well, the only way that we can truly measure these things is, well, we have to measure them in relationship to other places. We need to see the distance to some other place. So I asked how that would help. They couldn't really give me a good answer, but they did tell me that calculations are not measurements, which is rather interesting. And that's a good example of characteristic number four, poor scientific reasoning. Obviously, all measurements are calculations. We're calculating a fraction of that yardstick when we measure an object that's one foot eight inches long. Another example of a calculation that's used as a measurement, my weight is 195 pounds. If I wish to convert that to kilograms, do I have to find a scale that measures directly in kilograms, or can I divide it by 2.2? Obviously, calculations are valid measurements. But since this either didn't occur to them or they weren't able to do it, they had to simply deny that measurements could be calculations or calculations could be measurements. Let's move along to the next one. Now, the next question went right back to quantum erasers definition of the scientific method. Step number one, observe a natural phenomenon. Now, one of the things that they love to do is they like to argue about what is natural and what is not natural. So the next question was, here is a ruler, a protractor, and a compass. Are they natural objects? Specifically, are they of the natural world? Well, the answer was no, they're man-made objects. They're synthetic. The follow-up question to that was, can you use them to make measurements? Well, of course you can. That's what they're there for. So once again, we're dealing with the inconsistency of science denial. First, they're trying to play word games with the word natural. The opposite of natural is supernatural. A compass, a protractor, and a ruler are physical objects in the physical world. They're used to do physical sciences. They are not supernatural objects. They aren't ghosts. So even though they denied they were natural objects to keep in line with their flurf daddy, Quantum Eraser, and Nathan Oakley, they strayed from that by saying that, yes, indeed, you could do measurements with them, because that's a rather obvious thing. That's what those items are used to do. They're used to make measurements every day. In fact, many times when they use the argument by meme to talk about the sextant, they like to feature protractors in those memes. So why are they even bringing up this distinction between natural and non-natural? It stems from the idea that the scientific method is to be used as a weapon by the science deniers to try and exclude evidence that contradicts their narrative. That's simply the way Quantum Eraser designed it. He wasn't looking to protect science. He was looking for ways to deny evidence that violated his narrative. This is simply a variation of the calculations aren't measurements argument. If we don't want to look at measurements and calculations, we simply hand wave them away and say that they're not measurements because they're not quote unquote natural. I guess that means they didn't grow from seeds. But let's go ahead and have a look at the next question. Now the next question was one of a couple of compare and contrast questions. I asked what is the difference between precision and error? Perhaps a better way of phrasing that would have been between precision and accuracy. And the difference between the two, which eluded the entire panel, was that precision was the minimum interval that you could measure something. So for example, on a typical meter stick, it will be marked off in centimeters and millimeters. Your precision is to the nearest millimeter. Accuracy is how close your measurement is to what it really is. And that also was reflected in the lead up question to this, and that was, can we measure the exact distance between two points? We can't measure the exact distance between two points because there's always errors in our measurements. An understanding of the error bar of your measurement is key to science. Now, the next question had to do with Nathan Oakley and his curved adjacent argument. I asked the panel specifically if we could measure the angle between two lines. Did it matter if we rotated the objects that we were measuring the angle from, such as the arms of that compass, or we put another object next to them, such as that rock? They agreed that the angle does not change in any of those situations. 
But unfortunately, they will continue to promote the Nathan Oakley argument that you can't get the altitude to a star with a curved adjacent because the surface of the Earth is curved. Therefore, it's impossible to get that angle. This is yet another example of poor scientific reasoning, specifically the inability to make the connection between different sets of data. Next, we went into a little bit of trigonometry. Here we have an angle between two lines. Do we have to connect the tips of those lines to form a triangle in order to measure or say anything about the sine, the cosine, or the tangent of that angle? Now, one of the things that has been going around the science denial community lately is that trigonometry is only the study of triangles. That certainly is not the case. The panel in this particular question agreed that you did not have to connect the ends of those lines in, to form a triangle in order to evaluate that angle between the two lines. That's correct. There are many things in trigonometry that do not directly involve triangles specifically trigonometric identities. For any angle, sine squared plus cosine squared of that angle equals one. There are no triangles in sight. The proof of that theorem involves the use of triangles, but we can use that trigonometric identity to solve problems in mathematics without involving triangles. Likewise, I asked if we could use trigonometry on circles. Their answer was very telling, and demonstrates the limited understanding that they have. Well, yes, you could draw a circle, and then you could draw a triangle within a circle, but make sure it's not a sphere. Now, very tellingly in another question, I asked them if you had two bowling balls that just touched each other at one point. Did they share a tangent? Well, everybody seemed to agree that it did. And one person thought a tangent was a point rather than a line. Obviously, if they understand that two spheres can share a tangent, there's no triangles involved in that. So they don't make the connection. You know, they hear that trigonometry has to do with triangles, yet they understand that two spheres touching each other share a tangent. They don't seem to grasp the idea that trigonometry is much more than the study of triangles. Next, we had a look at angles. The first question asked whether or not the angle to the horizon changed based on the direction you were looking. Say you were on a ship 10 meters off of the water. Would the angle down to the horizon change depending on what direction you were looking? It does not, and they seem to understand that reasonably well. They did seem to struggle a little bit with the next one, and that was, can you measure the angular size of an object by looking at it? I've got an example here in the background where we're looking through a telescopic site that's marked off in mils. One mil equals 3.6 minutes of angle. Now, obviously, we're looking at that bird, and it's five mils from the bird's beak to its feet. So the answer is obviously yes, you can measure the angular size of an object or the angular distance between two objects. One of the main reasons that they struggled with this one is they tried to read way too much into the question. Uh, there are three things that you can tell by looking at the angular size of an object. You can look at the size of the object, the distance to the object, or the angular size of the object. If you know any two of those, you can calculate the third. However, None of that was given in this question. The only question that was asked was, can you measure the angular size from the beak to the feet of that bird? The answer is clearly yes. Now, it should be noted that there was a follow-up question to this, and that was, can you see the path of light between that bird and your eye? And they all agreed that you could not see the path of light. So whether it was refracted and curved or straight or bounced off a mirror, you can't tell that by looking at the object. All you see is the object as it appears to your eye in its apparent position. So that also has to do with the curved adjacent argument that Nathan likes to make, that you can't measure angles with light that's refracted. So again, the internal consistency and the, and the scientific reasoning, characteristic number four, 
is really lacking here. Now, once again, we had comments that tried to distract. Well, how do we know that that is calibrated properly? How do you know it's not? The assumption is that it is calibrated properly. The question is, can you measure the angular size of that object from beak to feet? The answer is yes. Now, why was that even brought up? It goes back to that original question about latitude and longitude. Does latitude and longitude describe a single point on the Earth? The answer is yes. Can we determine the angular size of that bird by looking at it through a calibrated scope? The answer is yes. The reason that they would bring that up, oh, you said yes? Well, how do you know the scope was calibrated? It probably wasn't, so the answer really is no. So you're wrong. That's not the way this works. That's the paranoia of conspiratorial thinking in action. Well, that's probably enough for today. Now, there's a second half where we're dealing with their understanding of physics and the mysteries of the formula for the circumference of a circle. But I think I'm going to do that in the next episode. And then I'm actually going to have a third episode because something happened today that I think was really noteworthy. And that is there was an interaction on his server between Quantum Eraser and Proto Thad, who was a guest on this channel not long ago. And it was really telling on the lack of understanding of basic trigonometry and sciences that is pervasive in the Flat Earth community. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you for stopping by. Hope you don't mind the audio on this too much. I know it's off a little bit, but hey, it's a weekend. Let's take it easy for a minute. So until next time, see you soon. Take care and stay healthy. Bye.